Hello. Hi, is this Victoria? Uh, yes, it is. All right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is a designer, an artist, an author, and the daughter of the legendary Vincent Price. We're very excited to welcome Miss Victoria Price to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. It's such an honor to have you on, Victoria. I actually had the opportunity to meet your dad. Oh, cool. <laughs> Back in the seventies, he was doing a uh, uh, full night of Edgar Allan Poe. It was in Rockford, Illinois. He was so nice to a young fan. He really was. You know, he was just somebody who I think really wanted to encourage people to live a joy-filled life and follow their dreams. So he always loved meeting young people, and and you know, if he figured if somebody had the time and energy and enthusiasm. To come back and meet him, he wanted to return the favor and be equally enthusiastic. Well, he he was a fan when he was younger. So the thing that I remembered, it was so cold in Rockford, Illinois, and I, I would have thought he would have been used to the cold. But I guess living in Hollywood for so many years, he came from an area where they had snow and stuff. Uh, he had this big white fur coat on. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But anyway, I never really realized that Vincent Price had a daughter until I saw you on the Hugh Hauser show. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, I'm a well-kept secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start off, Victoria, by, by kind of uh, talking about you. Um, and for listeners that may not know about you and, and the work that you do, uh, you're actually a designer. And I also wanted to make sure that our listeners knew about the book that you put out, you actually put out a biography on your dad, Vincent Price. I did. It came out in 1999. Uh, I wrote it um, because he and I spent a lot of time at the end of his life talking about art. Mm -hmm. That was really the impetus behind the book. Mm -hmm. And he uh, loved the visual arts, as did I. But after he died, people wanted a real full biography. And it was an incredible experience writing it. I learned so much about him, and it was it was a kind of a way for me to find some closure mm -hmm. with with everything that I needed to to find closure with in in my life with him. And so uh, that was that was a pretty incredible thing. And uh, it was out of print for a while, so now it's back out in print with a new preface, which is really great. Fantastic. You know, I was telling my, my daughter, who's the other host here, yesterday we had lunch, and we were talking about the fact that when Vincent uh, and, and your mom had you, he was 51 years old, and I really think that might have had a lot to do with the fact that you two were so close. Yeah, I think so. You know, he kind of was grandparents' age, and I think parents, parents sometimes are more stressed out than grandparents are. <laughs> and uh, some of that has to do with age. You know, you've done it before, so you're not as worried. The other part was, though, that he was at the height of his fame, so he was gone a lot, and yeah. he got to come back and kind of be the big hero in my life when he was home. Well, I, I love what you, you say about horror films, and maybe you can elaborate on this. You said you're not a horror film fan, but you love horror fans. I do. You know, my dad made 105 movies. He made maybe two-thirds of those movies that were not horror films. Mm -hmm. And yet, he is more famous now probably than he was when he passed away 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, why is that? Because he made those horror films, and the horror fans are just amazingly supportive of him. Absolutely. Well, I wanted to talk about, uh, and, and again, you know, because of these films that live on, I think maybe people that sit down maybe, you know, tonight and, and watch a Vincent Price movie, they don't realize how long ago uh, that was made because celluloid lives forever. But you actually, in 2011, had went on a lecture circuit to talk about you, what would have been the 100th anniversary of your father's birth. Uh, today, he would be 103, right? It's hard to be conceived. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, to be as, like we just said, as, as popular and as famous, it's true. I think about that all the time, though, with uh, people who, who no longer are able to access their, 
their parents' voice or see them as they were. And I can see my dad all the time. Right. It's just to go on YouTube, and there he is. How cool is that? <laughs> but, you, you know, I, I guess it's the whole art thing. It's kind of self-explanatory. I don't even know if it's really a question. But one would have thought that maybe you would have went into acting, but I guess the, the art thing with you was much stronger. You know, I did study acting, but when you grow up in that industry, you know that you have to want to do it more than anything in the world. And so I always, I was a double major in college, theater and art history, and I actually went on to grad school in acting. And I got there and I looked at all of my peers who were just burning with desire to do this thing. And I realized I wasn't. I didn't have that same burning desire. I loved public speaking and all the studying that I did really helps me with that, Mm -hmm. but um, you have to want it more than anything in the world. It's a tough profession. I saw that growing up. Well, I understand Vincent not only had a daughter, which of course is you, but uh, had a son by the name of Vincent. Yeah, we all go by our middle names, so he goes by Barrett. (laughs) (laughs) My first name is the same as my mom's, which is uh, is Mary, so I'm Mary Victoria, and he's Vincent Barrett. Yeah. But he actually, yeah, his first name is Vincent, and every so often he'll call me, and it'll pop up on my caller ID, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> Freak out. Like, what wow. the hell is that? And I take it he never went into acting either, then? No. He would have rather, I think, shot himself than go into acting. He had no interest. <laughs> well, let me ask you, uh, and, and as we're kind of doing this, I have questions coming in from listeners uh, about you and, and about Vincent, and so I'll kind of field those to you as I get them. Uh, the, the first question that I got was from uh, Joseph Frezza, and he says, I would like to ask Victoria this. I had heard that her father was not only a painter, but also a master chef, and he had learned from the best ones overseas. Was this true? Yes, he loved art, and he it wasn't just studying about art that he loved. He actually uh, loved making art. But when he was a teenager, he actually took over the family attic and he called it his, you know, artist garret. And he realized that he didn't have the same skill as those artists that he admired. Even though I think he was incredibly talented, really gifted uh, as an artist, but he never felt he was good enough. And so that's when he decided to study art instead of make art. But he continued to make art just as a, an avocation, as something he loved for the rest of his life. In terms of cooking, absolutely. He and my mom wrote um, a very famous cookbook. It's called, they actually wrote three cookbooks together, but the most famous is called The Treasury of Great Recipes. And it's actually the eighth most popular out-of-print book of any kind. I mean, Madonna's Sex is number one on that list. There's a <laughs> Stephen King book that's like number three. This cookbook is number eight. It's hugely popular, and its 50th anniversary is next year, so uh, Cala Editions of Dover Press is going to be republishing it, and I'm actually uh, writing a new preface. It'll be a nice preface sort of describing my family's whole culinary history because there were three Vincent Prices, uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, and my father, and my great-grandfather invented baking powder, and my grandfather was the head of the largest candy company in the United States. So my dad came by his interest in food legitimately. <laughs> wow, that's great. I never knew that. And that answers my question as to why you were named Victoria and your brother's name uh, Vincent, Vincent. Because that word Vincent goes all the way through the family. And Victoria is like an offshoot of Vincent in a way. <laughs> right. Well, and, and the first play that my dad did was Victoria Regina. It was very important <laughs> to him. And my mother grew up in Victoria, British Columbia. So there were... There were uh, little things uh, on both sides that um, that kind of tied all of that in. Now, the, the thing that was great about him was he was so diverse, did so many things other than horror, but he did something for children, and you went and saw your dad. It had something to do with Peter Pan <laughs> and, and, and scared the bejesus out of you. Can you talk about that? <laughs> you bet. <laughs> they took me to see him uh, play Captain Hook in Peter Pan, and I was maybe about, oh gosh, four years old. And I really had never seen anything that he had done um, before, because he made more movies than we're going to show that to a little kid. Right. And, of course, I freaked out, because there was my dad, and he was being mean. He was Captain Hook. And he was 
wearing a hook. <laughs> and I, I freaked out. And so my mother, who is British and not very fond of public displays of affection, was mortified, and she couldn't get me to shut up. So they had to take me backstage during intermission, and my mother photographed the whole thing. There's this whole series of photographs of my dad trying to prove to me that he's not a scary, bad person. It's very funny. <laughs> wow. That's, was there ever times that you were on set with your dad in a horror film? I went to see him do an evening with Edgar Allan Poe, which my mom designed the costumes for. And I went to see him in Theater of Blood in England, which was a lot of fun. And then I actually had a small part in Edward Scissorhands, but I filmed in Florida and he filmed in California, so we weren't on the set together. Wow. Right, right. You know, that, that's the one thing that I really give uh, kudos to, Tim uh, to Tim Burton, because... Well, first of all, we all know he loved your dad because it was a whole Vincent thing and met him through Disney and stuff, but he gave your father such an incredible part in Edward Scissorhands. He did. It was unbelievable what he did for him, and I think it was it was an incredible gift. I agree with you. It was something really, really wonderful. Uh, he gave him a swan song. He He wrote that part for him and gave him a swan song. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, another question we got in uh, from the audience. <clears throat> this one is from Colin McGuire, and he says, I would just like to ask Victoria what it was like growing up with what I'm imagining it was a fantastic art collection. Did she ever get to accompany Vincent to any auctions or uh, other times when he would purchase paintings, go to museums or things like that? Also, uh, could you ask her if she knows if he was a friend of Edward G. Robinson because I heard he was an, also a huge art collector? Yeah, it was incredible, incredible growing up with somebody for whom art was such a passion. And he was really an omnivorous collector. He collected, he bought his first piece of art when he was 12 years old, which was a first state Rembrandt etching, pretty amazing. And he bought his last piece of art two weeks before he died. And he wanted everyone, not just his kids, to understand how important art was. He he. He would have not been joking when he said, art saves lives, because he felt that his interest in art saved his life. Mm -hmm. It took him out of St. Louis and out of what would have been a perfectly nice, but sort of expected life for a kid who grew up uh, in an upper middle class St. Louis family, and it took him out into the world. And he so admired artists. And so he collected, he met many young artists, he supported their work, some of them became names that we know of now, like Jackson Pollock or Richard Diebenkorn, but many more just were artists who either continued on with their work or didn't, but they did something that my dad fell in love with, and he made a huge difference in those artists' lives. And so my dad, of course, wanted me to, to love art as much as he did, and I was a kid who loved two things which I still do, animals and books. Mm -hmm. And so he was a very smart man. He brought me into the love of art by getting me to see the pieces in the house that had animals in them. Mm -hmm. and, and that taught me how to see. And he also taught me how to appreciate art through story. So I remember one time, we, I was maybe about six years old, and we were standing in line in London in the winter to go into the show uh, about King Tut at the British Museum and you know what kid who's six years old seven years old wants to stand in line for three hours in January mm -hmm. to go see some museum show right. but my dad started telling me these stories about King Tut and the boy king and of course then I wanted to see it because he made the stories come to life and then the art supported that um, and in terms of Edward G. Robinson, yes, they were great friends. My dad's first play, as I mentioned before, was Victoria Regina with Helen Hayes. And my dad was so excited to be in New York because he could learn about all the art galleries there and go to all the museums. And so it was there that he met um, Edward G. Robinson, and he would follow him around the galleries to learn where he bought and he learned how to, as he called it, handle, which is uh, what Eddie did when he bought uh, art. He liked to bargain for it. <laughs> and they became very, very good friends over the years. And it was a very sweet story. Uh, my mom always threw very extravagant New Year's Eve parties. Mm -hmm. And one New Year's Eve, uh, everything was all set up for this big party. And there was a fire in Bel Air. 
And so they were asking all of the um, residents of Beverly Glen, where my parents were, to, uh, to evacuate. And so they stopped all the traffic at sunset and wouldn't let anybody up. And Edward G. Robinson, you know, was stopped by this cop, and so he used his full-on acting persona, <laughs> and, you know, the tough guy, and he said, yeah. my friend is up there, and he has an amazing art collection, and I don't want it to get burnt down in that fire, and I need to go help him. So little Caesar, of course, was allowed up, and he helped my parents uh, get some of the art out of the house. And the other group that was let through to help my parents get the art out of the house was the UCLA football team. Wow. They all they heard about the fire and the uh, my parents' art collection was required viewing for a lot of the UCLA art history students. And so the football team heard heard about the fire and they all came up to help too. Wow. But fortunately the fire didn't didn't reach the house and the collection was fine. And and for people that live uh, on the west coast out here in Los Angeles area, there still is a Vincent Price Art Museum, right? Yes. It's a great story. My uh, dad was on, first of all, he started the first uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. He put together an amazing board. He'd had an art gallery, uh, a private art gallery, and he wanted there to be a contemporary art museum. So he put together an, a board that had people like Fanny Bryce and Thomas Mann and um, just incredible intellectuals and art lovers and Hollywood people and uh, the Hollywood powers that be wouldn't support it. it they wouldn't put the money into it and my dad was very disillusioned so he, he became involved with uh, UCLA and uh, joined their arts council and that's why the students all knew about it and he, he opened the house up to the art department and they were very excited about uh, access to the collection. So other schools in LA reached out to him and a woman down in East Los Angeles named Judith Miller was an art teacher at this very small school. And she invited him to come down and speak and he just fell in love with, with what she was doing. She was so innovative and, and really pushing the envelope. And so he kept going back and one year he went back and my mom came with him because he was giving a graduation speech. Mm -hmm. And my mom was born, um, she was British, but she grew up in, in China and was one of these people who got to the United States and really felt like it was the promised land. It was that place that could allow you to transcend where you came from and, um, and become somebody new. And she became a costume designer. And so she said to my dad, you know, UCLA wants us to give part of the collection to them, but I think this place needs it more and I think they'll appreciate it more. And so they started with 90 pieces of art, and over their lifetimes, they donated 2,000 pieces of art. And it's an incredible collection. It's a hands-on collection. Students learn how to curate art. They curate art shows to conserve art. It's, it's not an elite. It's an incredible collection, but it's not about making art elite. It's about making art accessible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really encourage anyone in L.A. or anyone who visits L.A., go see this collection and go see the shows that we're putting on. We, we put on shows that represent the community, represent uh, underrepresented artists, emerging artists, people who some of the mainstream museums have neglected to show, and we're getting just incredible uh, publicity and excitement Finally, after having been ignored for many years, many people, I think, thought it was sort of a vanity project of my dad. Mm -hmm. But now that he's gone and people really get that this museum was about giving back and see what we're doing, it's, it's incredible, and he would be so proud, so proud of it. Yeah, you know, somebody on uh, one of my social networks had said, Vincent Price will always be my favorite actor. And I had commented that if you think about it, and your dad certainly was at the leader of the pack, you think about Lugosi... You think about Christopher Lee, who was in the later days, not quite as far back as, as Lugosi. They all had culture and art and were refined and had manners and appreciated art and literature. Well educated. Well educated. Yes. And I think that's what made him a good actor, even in horror films, you know? Right. Well, I think he was very grateful for the horror films because when he was in his 40s, the actors that were getting work the young, were, of course, younger. And those young actors were actors like Brando and James Dean who weren't classically trained theatrical actors with 
beautiful educations and beautiful diction. And horror films required that sort of ethos and that mm-hmm. aesthetic. Exactly. And it gave him these roles to play. He also, the actors he admired most were actors like Edward G. Robinson or Jimmy Cagney, Spencer Tracy. He admired character actors. Yes. And he was such a handsome young man that they wanted him to be a romantic lead, and he hated that. So he was so grateful to be able to play villains. Of course, he often did it tongue-in-cheek. I just uh, We did a screening here in Santa Fe, George R. R. Martin of Game, Game of Thrones bought uh, the one of the art houses here in Santa Fe, and he shows just wonderful. The programming at the theater is incredible. They show really fun things. And so they did some screenings of Dr. Fibes, and I did a talk on last Sunday, and, and we did a screening, and I hadn't ever seen it on the big screen. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, it was such fun to see what, what fun my dad had <laughs> making that movie, because, of course, he... He didn't speak, really, so he had to do a lot with his eyes, and there was a lot of humor in that film. Well, we have more questions coming in from listeners, but before I go back to those, in talking about how Vincent obviously had fun with this, I read a story online, and I'm hoping maybe you can share it with our listeners, uh, about when House of Wax came out, he was doing theater in New York, and he, after he was off stage, he would go and sneak in and kind of watch the watchers who were watching House of, Watch, well, House of Wax watched them and how they reacted to the film. Is that true? Yeah, he was. it was true. He was doing, I think, Richard III on Broadway, and the movie had been out over a year by then, and he was just kind of blown away that this, this movie that he had made was still in first-run movie houses on Times Square and incredibly popular. So I think the initial impetus for him to go in was to see whether there were still full houses and people were still enjoying it. But he decided that the, the most fun thing he could do was sit behind teenage girls who were just scared out of their wits. <laughs> and uh, he would sit right behind them and when the credits would roll, he would lean forward and say, did you like it? <laughs> and of course, he went into orbit. Uh, and I, I think he had a lot of fun with that. Well, he had a good sense of humor. You, you know, Tiffany was telling me before we went on, and she didn't get a chance to finish the story because we had to go on. Maybe you can kind of make me understand more. I know back in the McCarthy era, okay, there was what we call blacklisting of actors, and your father was gray-listed. I didn't know there was such a thing as gray-listing. Right. The, the blacklisting was, of course, horrible. People took their own lives. People had to flee the country. Their careers were completely wrecked. It was a, an absolutely horrible thing, but... There was also gray listing, and, and those were lists of people who were suspected of being communist, and uh, studios were encouraged not to hire them. The list that my dad was on was a list called pre-war anti-Nazi sympathizers. Mm-hmm. So if we unpack that, what that means is, if before World War II you were smart enough to think that Hitler was evil, you must have been a communist. Right. Wow. And, you know, it was a very uh, illustrious list. Eleanor Roosevelt was on the list. Um, and my dad was not hired for a number of years, and about a year and a half. And he was a workaholic. He was somebody whose career meant everything to him. And so the fact that he wasn't working was, was horrible. And when he finally was able to get his name cleared, he was offered two parts. And one was a play in New York called We're No Angels, which actually later became a movie with um, Humphrey Bogart. Mm-hmm. And the, the other was this movie in this brand new technology. And they were really touting this technology and he thought that would might be an exciting thing and that was House of Wax so that was really the beginning of his horror career well we have uh, we have another question from uh, listener Steve Rattay and he says I would love to hear any stories that Victoria may have about Vincent's time working with the great William Castle who was the director of House of Haunted Hill and The Tingler also I recently watched the film Wales of August which Vincent was terrific in and found out that it was the only film he was ever nominated for an award for um, was I was curious if you if awards or anything like that ever mattered to Vincent? He should have been given an honorary Oscar, in my opinion. No, you know there was a big campaign at the end of his life to get him an honorary Oscar, and it never happened. No. I think the award 
the only he wasn't surprised by that. And actually, uh, when I was in my twenties, I had the assignment. I worked for an ad agency that did uh, all the print advertising for most of the major movie studios. And I had the assignment the year Wales of August came out to go down to the academy to um, get the when they announced the uh, the Oscar nominations in those pre-internet days. You were sent down to the lobby of the academy and. And that was so that we could rush all that into our ads uh, that that day. But of course, I had a, a personal interest, and I really hoped that my dad was going to be nominated. He was nominated, I think, for for some sort of independent award, uh, like a. Um, and he, I don't think he won it. And he was I, he was nominated. He was given an honorary award by um, I, I can't remember the the group, but it was um, a, a Los Angeles, I think it might have been the L.A. Film Critics Circle mm-hmm. uh, at the end of his life, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I know that meant a lot to him, but um, I don't think he was surprised he didn't get the honorary Oscar. He always sort of saw himself as an outsider. The award that I think he deserved and and would have loved to have gotten was uh, the Kennedy Center uh, Award. Because For sure. It wasn't just his acting career. He did so much for the visual arts in this country and so much for the culinary arts in this country. He was such a spokesperson for the arts. He served on the White House Art Committee under Kennedy and uh, um, Johnson. He served on the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, which promotes the art of Native Americans for 15 years and traveled all over the country doing it. And, and that was, I think, the award that he, I think he would have loved to have gotten. In terms of uh, William Castle, I actually don't have any stories except how he met William Castle, which was that he was, I think, sitting and having some pie <laughs> in a coffee shop, and William Castle came up to him and sat down and sort of started sharing these ideas for his films. And uh, my dad was somebody who just loved people's enthusiasm, and I think he thought Castle was an incredible showman, and it was an opportunity to keep working, doing things that were fun. And, you know, you look at at the horror films, and no matter what he's doing, he always appears to be having a good time doing yeah. it. You know, he's bludgeoning someone to death, and there's, there's a certain fun quality to that, and certainly those films with William Castle epitomize that. Well, you know, I've got to take this opportunity because I'm the host and I can uh, <laughs> to, to ask you about my favorites because when, when I really knew your dad and watched him was at the drive-in during the American International Pictures days and that was Roger Corman and was Samuel Z. Arkoff and uh, uh, Nicholson, which was his partner. Now, I've talked to both of them and uh, I was wel- kind of welcomed to Hollywood by Samuel Z. Arkoff, crusty old guy that he was and I asked him, I was like, who did you like better? Do you like Boris Karloff better? Do you like Vincent Price better? Better. He said, I like Vincent Price better because he would wait for his money. <laughs> Karloff wanted to be paid now, but but Vinny, Vinny would wait until he got the box office in. Did, did Vincent ever say anything about uh, American International or Sam Arkoff or Roger Gorman? Oh, he absolutely adored uh, Roger. And, you know, I my dad got along with everyone. There's, there's I only really heard my dad say a negative thing about a colleague once or twice. He got along with everyone, and I think he, he appreciated uh, what both of them were doing, creating a, a kind of dynasty uh, in, in a way that he got to be the center of. My dad was always very humble about money. Of course, you know, everyone knows that he got paid a pittance to mm-hmm. do Michael Jackson's Thriller, and, uh, and that was the only time I ever heard him complain about not making enough money. So yeah, he was he was pretty easygoing about money. I think because he he was very fearful about money. He came from a family with which sort of passed on a, a kind of a legacy of fear around money, and I think he would never have thought to um, to complain. <laughs> I don't know if you got anything going on with the estate or anything, but I actually heard there was some money due Vincent from the Michael Jackson uh, recordings that wasn't paid. Is that right, or is that a rumor? Wow, well, let me know if you hear any more about that. That would be great. Uh, 
All right. Well, we have uh, another I'm question. I'm kind of a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day workaholic, so that could change my whole life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just joking. Uh, we, uh, we have another question from uh, the audience. It says, nobody, never, nobody ever mentions that Vincent had a marvelous talk show that was syndicated in the late 70s. It was very funny, and he would play skits and pranks with the audience. Uh, he was very good with the regular folk on the show, and I always thought that that must have been a fun project for him. Does Victoria have any stories about this, or does anyone even remember it? I don't even remember it. I know that he guest he sat in quite a bit and guest hosted for a lot of the um, the talk show hosts, like even Johnny Carson, from time to time, because he was such an affable and intelligent person. You know, here's somebody who was so he was an incredible listener, and he was genuinely interested in other people. So I know that he often sat in as a guest host, but. I don't even know that he had his own talk show. So if you actually have clips or know more about it, please email me at info at vincentprice.com. I, I, you know, I'm always fascinated when I learn something new about my dad that I didn't know. Please, please tell me that you are aware of the hilarious house of Frightenstein. I am aware of the hilarious <laughs> house of Frightenstein, yes. I did a, I did a convention up in um, Toronto a few years ago and uh, be connected with um, the producer of the show and, and uh, learned a lot about it. And boy, is he beloved in Canada because of that. <laughs> that was the coolest show that was ever on television. I saw that. I was like, wow. Yeah. Uh, kind of going along, Victoria, things that I didn't know about. Um, when we had announced that you were going to be on the show, um, I had somebody contact me that said that she had gotten a book uh, that Vincent had written years ago. She got it years and years ago, and I thought, okay, well, she's probably talking about one of his cookbooks or something like that. Um, but it's actually a book called The Book of Joe that Vincent Price wrote, and it's about a dog and his man. And I wanted to find out two things. Uh, this person let me borrow the book. Um, I wanted to find out what you could tell the listeners about it. And also, this person has requested that I ask you if you have a copy, because if not, she would like to send it to you. Oh, how sweet is that? Yes, I do have his copy. It's one of my favorite books, and we're in the process of slowly re-releasing a, a number of the books he's written. Uh, the first one that's going to come out is I Like What I Know, which is his visual autobiography, mm -hmm. and it's the book he wrote during the period that he was gray-listed, and it's about his life in the visual arts. And it was a suggestion by my mom to, to write that book, and... So it will come back out with a, a new preface. Basically, I'll take uh, the nine months of interviews that I did with him about art and kind of update the book in terms of what he did in the arts following 1956 or 8 when he wrote the book. Mm -hmm. But then he loved writing so much that he continued to write for the rest of his life. And the next book that he wrote was a book called The Book of Joe. And, and it is a, a wonderful book about... Uh, not only Joe, who was uh, my dad's wonderful mutt, um, but also all of the pets that he'd had in his life up till then. And it's, it's, it, it's a, I, I definitely think that there'll be a wonderful audience for this book, and I'm, I'm so glad that this listener loved it as much as I do. I'm a, we, my whole family were huge animal lovers. Um, in fact, as I'm sitting here giving this interview, my rescue seven-pound chihuahuas thinks my finger is her dog's <laughs> toy. So, um, and she's about to start growling any second now, so you may hear her. But uh, she, um, she's definitely, you know, a continuation. I, I, I was never a chihuahua person, but my dad had three chihuahuas at the end of his life, and uh, I never thought I'd have one, but now I see, I see what he saw in them. Uh, and Joe was, the book of Joe has a wonderful story about a lawsuit that was uh, brought against my dad uh, by someone for something that they claimed that Joe did, and, and it's a very, very funny story about this, this uh, court case uh, versus Joe, this man versus my dad and Joe. <laughs> well, you know, you kind of had some in, in your life, unless it, it's some rumor because things are always wrong on the internet. Kind of paralleled mine in a way because I'm I'm divorced, and my ex-wife kind of had a jealousy between how close my daughter and I are. Here we're doing a show together, my daughter and I, and I understood that Vincent's third wife, Coral Brown. 
that he met on Theater of Blood, of course, had a little bit of jealousy between you and your dad, and, and something happened, or you revealed something to them that kind of caused it to ease over. Yeah, Coral was, um, <laughs> you know, I've come to wonder if, you know, perhaps he hadn't really electrocuted her instead of <laughs> doing it in the movie, and <laughs> our whole family life wouldn't have been a lot better. Uh, Coral, you know, he was madly in love with Coral, and he, uh, he met her in 1972. We were living uh, in London while he was making the movie, and he, we rented a house at 1 Eaton Square, and Coral lived at 16 Eaton Place. <laughs> and so uh, it was a very uncomfortable summer, and shortly after that, my parents were divorced, and uh, Coral came into our lives, and she was, oh, really um, difficult. She called herself my wicked stepmother. Really? Um <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, Coral and I kind of had a love-hate relationship, and she was also a, a real mentor to me sometimes, and so we we had an, an interesting relationship, but she was truly horrible to my brother and his children, and, uh, you know, my brother and I never got to spend any time with my dad together uh, for almost 15 years. She really kept the whole family apart, and that, mm. was, that was really, really difficult. That's sad. But I understand uh, that later on, after Coral's passing, that you and, and Vincent were able to kind of get close again and, and had uh, basically the rest of his years, you guys were very close together. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, I had read that you and Vincent we're also very good friends with Roddy McDowell, and Roddy was one of the people that helped care for your father at the end with you. Is that correct? You know, Roddy was had an immense capacity for friendship. And, you know, my dad, I will say this about my dad. My dad really did his best to not let Coral uh, interfere with our relationship. And so he always found time to see me and, and stood up to her a lot uh, for me, which for a man who disliked conflict as much as he did, I, I really appreciate it, and, um, and I'm grateful to him. But it was still difficult, and so to get to spend that kind of time with him was, was amazing. So Roddy really, is, he was great friends with Coral and, and my dad, and was there for them when they were ill. And uh, he, after my dad died, he, he very much was uh, a regular visitor at the house, and I put together a group of people uh, along with uh, the man who lived uh, uh, in my dad's house and took care of him. And, and we sort of had a group of five guys who came and helped us um, cook and take care of my dad. And, and it was Roddy who called them the angels. And so that's actually the story. Roddy was just very supportive of, of that and, and was a big part of, of my dad's life at the end. And um, I hope I got to return the favor because right before Roddy passed away himself, I was asked to write his biography for A&E Biography, and um, he saw it right before he passed away. So what, what I hope it? that I was able to, to thank him in a way by paying tribute to his life. I, I was so blessed to have met your father. I was so blessed to have met your father. If I could have met Roddy, that would have been even doubly great. He was such a dear man. Jeez. Wow. Oh, he was just... Uh, he, you know... One of the things, I learned two things from Roddy. Roddy said that he really felt that a lot of people in Hollywood didn't understand that Hollywood had a history that was an important part of the 20th century. And he said to me, you've grown up hearing all these stories. Pay attention to them because Hollywood ignores its own history. Mm -hmm. And that was a really important uh, uh, piece of advice he gave me because I did grow up hearing incredible stories. And the other thing I learned from Roddy was what true friendship is. I, there's very few people I've ever met who uh, have the capacity for friendship and bringing people together that Roddy did. And, and whenever I meet them, uh, I really recognize that certain people have a gift for friendship. It's, it's a quality, and it's something to be admired. It's, it's those days, Roddy and, and your dad, to where they had an understanding about people that people just don't seem to have an understanding of, of who people are and what makes them tick. It's like, for instance, I just wanted to bring this up because I admire you so much because uh, you're an advocate for gay rights. 
and you had said the scariest thing you ever did was to tell your father that, that you were gay. Yeah, well, my mother, uh, <laughs> my mother, whose entire career was completely supported by um, gay men. I mean, she was a costume designer on Broadway, and and everybody who gave her a break was a gay man. And when I came out to my mom, she basically threw me out of the house and didn't speak to me. Hmm. And so, and she said, you know, whatever you do, don't tell your father. And so I was terrified to tell him. And when I told him, he was so lovely and so supportive. And he, you know, he reached over and he held my hand and he said, I've always understood the, the closeness that um, men and men have and women and women have. And, you know, he just really made me feel like that shouldn't be judged. And so even though my mother was incredibly unsupportive, he always had all of my friends over. In fact, most of the angels who took care of my dad at the end of his life were gay men, and he loved that. He was just a, a man without judgment, an open-hearted, loving man without judgment. And, um, you know, how grateful I might have had that, especially since I had the, the other in my mother. Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so happy that he has uh, had and has the children that he's got because I think you and your brother are great people and and you've done so much I'm telling you straight out okay I mean I'm not gonna say names or whatever but if you look back I love all the horror celebrities and all the old actors and all the families and children and everything to me you seem to have a little bit more dignity a little bit more respect and don't seem to be out just for the almighty dollar as a few of them might that's just my opinion but I really admire the way you hold yourself with dignity and respect I think your father is so proud of you Oh, you're so lovely. Thank you for saying that. You know, it's interesting because, you know, as, as you said at the beginning, I'm, I'm not a fan of horror films, and that's simply because I don't like being scared. I don't like violence, and I don't like being scared. I am not the person you want sitting next to you in a scary <laughs> movie because you will be black and blue. Right. I'm grabbing onto you so hard it will hurt. I mean, I just get scared. And so I, I really, the first time I was asked to go to a horror convention, I thought, what the heck am I going to, you know, have to say to these people? Uh, you know, I'm not going to have anything in common. And this was in 19, I think, 99, and um, my book was about to come out. So the publicist sent me to this horror convention in Washington, D.C. in August, which was not a big draw. And, you know, the pretty much the most humid place on the planet in August. <laughs> and I had the best. Time. So basically, they sat me at this little table, and people came up and talked to me. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just chat about my dad, and hopefully I won't sound stupid about horror movies. And one by one, people came up to me, and they told me what my dad had meant to them. That's right. And I just had tears in my eyes, and, and just incredible stories of, of how much he meant. And I had this epiphany then that has carried on because this continued then in, in 2011 with the Vincentennial, my dad's 100th birthday, and people asked me to come out again for that, and and I, I decided to really talk about how my dad lived his life, because I thought, well, you know, it's something I need to remember, how to live life with generosity and open-heartedness and, and, and to give back and to always be curious and always want to learn to be a good listener, and so that's really what I wanted to talk about. And as I went out and I did this, I had this same feeling that I was meeting these incredible people. And, and slowly I realized that because my dad grew up loving art in a, you know, Midwestern town, he felt like an outsider his whole life. And because he felt that art had saved his life and had, had given him this, this passion that took him out into the world, and then he became famous, he ended up being able to use his fame to give back to people. And so I'm really kind of an introvert at heart, but when I go and I, I go to a horror convention and I'm listening to everybody's stories, I know this sounds sort of like woo-woo, but I do live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, so, you know, <laughs> uh, we're all woo-woo here. But, <laughs> you know, I sometimes feel like I'm channeling my dad in the sense that I get it. I feel what it's like to connect with people and really hear them and really I understand why my dad loved what he did so much and it reminds me to, to live a life where 
I choose joy and I choose love over fear and I step out of my own self. And so really the reason I do this is because it reminds me what's important. And I had the incredible privilege of growing up with a man who, I read this thing recently, I think last week it said, when you have a choice, and every day you have a choice, many choices, choose to lean into joy. Mm -hmm. I thought that's what my dad did with his life. He leaned into joy every chance he could. And going out and, and doing what I do and talking about my dad reminds me to lean into joy. And I hope that by doing it, I can remind other people as well. So and, and you're it's, giving, really, it's a gift. And you're giving me your father's strength because, okay, I've been doing radio since the 70s, <laughs> but when somebody means so much to me, I get all emotional and I start getting that way. And I'm like, I can't do that. i got to be professional. And you're giving me your dad's strength and I can feel it. And you really are somebody that... that Okay, everybody loves you. They love your dad, and they love you because of your dad, but they also love you and your own merit, too, because I think you're an incredible person. Thank you. Wow. I mean, thank you so much because, you know, you sit here and you're, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 like I said, the other thing I inherited from my dad, you know, they always called my dad a, a renaissance man, yes. but I, I really believe that that's the name they give to somebody who's famous the rest of us they call workaholic multitasker <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and and he was a workaholic and and both my brother and i kind of inherited that that compulsion from him and sometimes you sit in your own little space and you're working away at you know keeping your clients happy and doing this and that and you you know you just you kind of don't have a sense of that what you're doing means anything to anyone and and I just want to thank you for being so generous and in what you've said to me because um, you made my week. Thank you. Well, thank you. God bless you. It means a lot to us because it helps us to hang on to uh, really a bygone era. You think about, he did many movies other than horror, but you know I'm a big horror fan. i got to always bring it up. You, you think about how many actors in the horror genre nowadays can you mention one name, their first name, and know who they are? And the only one that's really left in that era is Christopher Lee. That's it. Yeah. And they're all gone. Yeah. Um, well, as we wrap this up, Victoria, uh, I wanted to ask you um, if there are any uh, appearances or anything like that coming up um, where fans can come out and meet you. Um, I don't know if you're, you'll have your book with you or if they're, where they're able to get one, but I had heard, I think, that you're going to be at Rock and Shock in a month or so? I'm actually doing four, <laughs> four conventions. <laughs> Next weekend, I'll be in Waco, Texas. I'm a designer, and I'm working on a design job in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice little detour on my way to Dallas to work with my client. I'll be in Waco at the heart of Texas, I think it's called, convention. Me and the cast are the walking dead, so that ought to be <laughs> fun. And then I will be in Pittsburgh, um, for oh gosh I can't I, it's monster something in Pittsburgh and then rock and shock in Massachusetts and then I'm really excited um, I'm finally going back to chiller theater in New Jersey awesome. um, but all of this is part of a larger tour um, last year uh, some of my clients uh, decided to that they really wanted to support me in growing my dad's legacy. Yes. And so um, they are huge wine buffs and, and gourmets, and, and the husband is from St. Louis, mm -hmm. like my dad. And so they really love learning about wines, and they have put together a group of Vincent Price wines. Oh. And uh, my dad was the first spokesman for the California Wine Association. And what you have to understand is in the 60s and 70s when he was doing this, California wine was like, you know, like mm -hmm. people were like, are you kidding? You might as well just, you know, put the gas nozzle up to your you know, <laughs> mouth and drink out of it. I mean, <laughs> are you kidding me? And he was so supportive of, of California wines. And so um, we bottled four California wines, a Chardonnay, a Pinot, um, noir, a Cabernet, and then a House Red. And for me, the important part, um, I, I don't drink, so <laughs> this was something that they wanted to do to really support that legacy and the legacy of the cookbook and this whole idea of sharing meals and sharing experiences. But the really fun part for me was that um, I love graphic arts and graphic design, and, and I worked in the advertising industry, as I said, for 
for years. And so I, I got four artists to create the labels, and all of the labels are, and all, the, all of the wines are named, um, inspired by Ed, Edgar Allan Poe. Cool. So all of the labels are inspired by Edgar Allan Poe. So we're going to have these wine dinners and wine tastings all over the United States, including one to benefit the James Beard Foundation at the James Beard House in New York City, wow. which is just really exciting. So these are also, we're having one in Chicago, St. Louis, Atlanta, at the Poe Museum on Halloween in Richmond, Virginia. Um, in Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, it's going to be really, really fun. Well, I guess I won't have to and worry about. I will about be at all of those. <laughs> if you're going to be so. there, ha- if you're going to be there on Halloween, I won't have to ask you the question I was going to ask, and that's: Has any kid ever come up to your door dressed like your dad at <laughs> Halloween time? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I'm always so disappointed. Santa Fe, we don't really do Halloween. Uh-huh. Last year in Santa Fe, we actually did a screening of House of Wax, and it was so fun because we had a costume contest, and uh, it was actually at George R. R. Martin's Theater again, and it was really, really cool. And this guy comes in, and I literally almost swallowed my head. He, he was Professor Jared from House of Wax. Uh-huh in the wheelchair and he was uncanny i mean he was he looked just like my dad it was freaky wow so no kid has done it but he really nailed it on the the costume and we're gonna have costume contest in richmond virginia at the poe museum on well, halloween so it's some, be uh, really fun and it's going to be like a six thousand mile road trip for me so i will be <laughs> driving all over the country just like my dad did when he did his uh, oscar wilde all over the country so it's going to be a lot of fun well despite the fact that it won't be halloween there because you don't celebrate it so you probably call the police if somebody shows up at your door dressed <laughs> like dr fives that would be me because <laughs> oh good yes. excellent <laughs> thank you then i won't be scared i'll invite you in <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we want to thank you so much for joining us, Victoria. And I want to let our listeners know that you can actually check out uh, three websites online. All of them are great reads. Uh, The first one is cookingvincent.com. And then, of course, there is vincentprice.com and victoriaprice.com. And, Victoria, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show. It is such a pleasure and was such an honor to have you on and to chat with you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. And thank you again for being so loving and generous. It, it meant a lot to me. Well, and your it dad. It meant a lot to my brother and me in supporting uh, our dad's legacy. That's okay. He was such a great man because, like I said, uh, when I got to meet him, it was very short. But I said, Mr. Price, it's such an honor to meet you. He said, Son, it's an honor to meet you. And that just meant the world. I just carried that with me all my life, you know? Wow. And, you know, he meant he meant that. He was. He only said what was in his heart. And, and that's the kind of guy he was really just pure heart absolutely well thank you again so much victoria we hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend you too thank Uh, you all right thank you bye-bye bye